Well, it's a pleasure to uh, to be back. It's one of my favorite things to do in May. Uh, come come to to uh, to Annecy. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about approaches to measuring vaccine herd protection, which most people didn't think much about until uh, the pandemic, and then herd protection and herd immunity was a, almost a, a matter of our daily conversation. Is there a trick to? Ah, uh, oh, okay. So as we all know, the uh, double-blind randomized controlled clinical trial is the gold standard design for measuring uh, vaccine uh, protection. Uh, the, the, this design is used in phase three uh, evaluations of vaccines, but even after uh, well done phase three efficacy trials, uh, uncertainties may, may linger. Uh, does the vaccine work in a wider spectrum of recipients uh, under realistic public health conditions, not the idealized settings that, that characterize randomized trials, uh, against all outcomes of practical, uh, not just biological uh, importance, and including um, herd protection, uh, as well as direct protective effects, since traditionally the individually randomized trial is designed specifically to, an to, to analyze only direct vaccine protection. So when we talk about herd effects, we're talking about population uh, level effects in a vaccinated population. Um, above that, beyond what you would expect on the basis of vaccine efficacy and vaccine uh, coverage, due to a, usually a combination of protection of non-vaccinated people uh, owing to their proximity to vaccinated people and enhanced protection of vaccinated people owing to their proximity to other vaccinated uh, people. So that uh, if we have a 60% effective, uh, efficacious, I should say, vaccine, given to 60% uh, of the population, uh, all other things being equal, we would expect roughly a 36% impact. If we saw 50%, obviously something more is going on that usually is herd protection. A good example of vaccine herd protection uh, was provided by the experience in North Queensland, Australia, uh, in which uh, indigenous uh, children uh, were experiencing uh, a huge burden uh, of hepatitis A. And so a program was mounted uh, to um, uh, vaccinate. Uh, can you, oops, well. Anyway, to to uh, to vaccinate uh, uh, indigenous children, and as you can see from the uh, the line uh, after uh, after the program was was issued, unsurprisingly, the the rate of hepatitis A in indigenous kids went way down. But not only the indigenous kids, also the uh, over five year olds went down. They were not vaccinated. Not only the indigenous people, but also the adjacent non indigenous people. So this is classic vaccine herd protection. We usually think of uh, three mechanisms whereby a vaccine can induce herd protection. Um, one mechanism would be uh, in, the, in the instance of a live vaccine, uh, uh, vaccinees shedding the uh, the the live vaccine and infecting uh, neighbors and immunizing uh, neighbors. Of course, this is the the classic example is oral polio vaccine. But this is actually a rather uncommon mechanism whereby vaccines induce herd protection. Another uh, uh, mechanism uh, is uh, the instances in which there is passive transfer of immunity vertically uh, from mother to fetus across the placenta in the instance of uh, maternal uh, immunization. But by far the most 
common and important mechanism uh, by which vaccines induce herd protection um, is by uh, reducing horizontal transmission from person to person. Um, And uh, uh, this can occur either with live or with killed vaccines. The hepatitis A vaccine was a killed vaccine, not a live vaccine in Queensland. Um, uh, but, of course, it only applies to uh, target pathogens that are transmitted from person to person. So to better understand this last mechanism, uh, it's helpful to review a couple of elementary uh, concepts. Um, the transmissibility of an infection uh, can be quantified by the uh, basic reproduction number, r naught, which uh, at, until a few years ago, nobody had ever heard of, but it, you know, it appeared on the front page of the New York Times every day. Um, but actually, you know, and, and if you don't like my explanation of this, uh, I would refer you to the movie um, Contagion, um, where the young EIS officer, Kate Winslet, uh, who is apparently modeled on uh, a young Anne Shukat, uh, an epidemic intelligence officer, gives a very uh, uh, elegant uh, explanation uh, of, uh, our, of our not. At any rate, this is the average number uh, of transmissions expected uh, when you uh, introduce a single primary case uh, uh, into a totally susceptible population. Uh, the higher the R naught, obviously, the higher the transmission. This can be illustrated by this cartoon, a hypothetical uh, 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 pathogen with an R naught of four, uh, uh, undergoing two generations of person to person transmission with the number of cases basically quadrupling with each generation of transmission. Now, R0 is an idealized uh, concept, and one major deviation uh, of reality from the ideal is population immunity. So the R0 depends on the population being totally susceptible, which incidentally meant that all of these New York Times uh, articles that cited R0 were, were, were misnomers. They were not talking about uh, R0. Uh, but be that as it may, if some contacts of infectious uh, individuals are uh, immune, the contacts may fail to pass, pass on uh, uh, a transmission. Uh, and this has generated another R number, R sub N. This is really what uh, what the newspapers should have been talking about, the effective uh, reproduction number, which is the actual uh, number of transmissions under realistic uh, circumstances. And one way of thinking about vaccine herd protection is that, um, by vac- uh, that vaccines generate herd protection uh, do so by lowering the effective reproduction number below the basic reproduction number. This is, again, illustrated by an expansion of the cartoon. The upper panels is what I, uh, I showed earlier. The lower uh, panel shows a, a situation uh, with the same pathogen, an R naught of four, uh, but now only 20, uh, uh, 25% of the population is susceptible, uh, 75% uh, immune in each generation of person to person transmission only yields one case, not four cases. Now, uh, in simplistic terms, the algebraic relationship between uh, R naught and R sub N is given by the top formula. The R naught is equal to the basic reproduction number times the proportion uh, susceptible. Uh, a simple algebraic rearrangement of that uh, equation uh, uh, leads to the conclusion that if the proportion susceptible is the reciprocal uh, of R naught, then R sub N becomes one and the infection should be stable over time. Uh, and if it goes below that, uh, the incidence of the infection should die out uh, over time. 
And this has generated what we call the herd immunity threshold, one minus that reciprocal, uh, which is the proportion of the population that needs to be resistant to onward uh, transmission uh, that is required to um, uh, extinguish transmission. This has led to uh, quite a bit of armchair epidemiology um, of epidemiologists sitting with feet on the feet on the desks and and, and computing and modeling um, uh, basic reproduction numbers and corresponding herd immunity thresholds. As you can see, as the reproduction number goes up, the herd immunity threshold goes way up. The what is uh, what is a misconception, and was a common misconception during the pandemic, is this herd immunity threshold corresponds to the percent vaccinated, but if the vaccine does not successfully uh, block onward transmission, that's not the percent that needs to be uh, uh, vaccinated. The percent goes way up, of course. And this, of course, was the case for COVID vaccines, which were rather disappointing uh, in their ability to block transmission, though they were uh, much better at producing uh, protection against disease. Now, traditionally in epidemiology, the way we analyze vaccine herd protection uh, is after a vaccine is licensed and out there in public health uh, use. Uh, and and typic, what is typically done is we uh, rely on uh, analysis of the yearly trend uh, of infection, of the target infection in relation to the yearly trend of vaccine uh, coverage uh, in the population. That was used in the Australia example that I gave you. But of course, these, uh, 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 these sorts of secular trend analyses uh, are very vulnerable to uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc uh, errors of uh, inference and biases. Um, and so that raises the question, are there ways that we can analyze uh, herd protection uh, uh, before licensure, not waiting until a vaccine is out there so that we can actually use our knowledge about herd protection uh, to make decisions uh, about uh, vaccine licensure and deployment? Uh, and with methods that are not vulnerable to these uh, observational biases. Well, one way, and uh, uh, Hannah gave you a sneak preview, uh, is to use cluster randomized uh, trials. In a typical cluster randomized trial, the unit of randomized allocation to the arms of the trial is not individuals, as in the classical phase three efficacy trial design, but a group of individuals, uh, typically, but not always a geographically defined uh, cluster. Uh, eligible and consenting uh, individuals within the cluster then receive the agent that is assigned to the group. Within the group, everybody is assigned to the same uh, agent. Randomization is typically done uh, uh, before enrollment of individuals, and individuals are then followed up longitudinally. And so the, the architecture of a cluster randomized trial uh, is uh, very similar to the architecture of an individually randomized trial. A study population is uh, accrued from a target population. The study population is, is randomized to compared arms who are followed concurrently and longitudinally for the comparative incidence of the target infection. But the big difference here is that R circle. Uh, it's clusters of people who are randomized, not individuals uh, who are randomized. How do we uh, measure uh, various uh, uh, measures of vaccine herd protection in a cluster randomized trial. Imagine that these are two uh, representative clusters in a two-arm uh, uh, cluster randomized trial. One arm getting a st study vaccine, another arm getting a control uh, agent. Now, 
in in any of these clusters, there will be individuals who get the agent assigned to their cluster, be it vaccine or control agent, and people don't. If we compare the uh, attack rates, the incidence of uh, of the target infection uh, amongst uh, non-vaccinated uh, members of the vaccine clusters versus non-recipients of the control agent in the control clusters, this gives us the most unbiased estimate of what's called indirect protection, which is the measure of herd protection that most of us think about. It's protection of unvaccinated people who live close to vaccinated uh, people. If we compare the attack rates in recipients of the study vaccine versus recipients of the control vaccine, this gives us the most unbiased uh, estimate of what we call total vaccine protection. This is protection not only directly induced by immunological responses to the to the vaccine in vaccinees, but also the benefit that vaccinees have of living nearby other vaccinees and experiencing reduced transmission. And then, of course, overall vaccine protection is the uh, uh, overall protective effect to the entire target population, uh, both due to direct uh, effects and herd effects uh, experienced. Uh, an example of a cluster randomized trial was a study we did years ago uh, in Calcutta, uh, India. Uh, this was actually a phase four cluster randomized trial of an older generation vaccine against typhoid fever, consisting only of VI polysaccharide um, done in the slums of Calcutta. Eligibility was for basically everybody aged two years um, uh, and older. The vaccine under study was VI polysaccharide against typhoid. The control agent was hepatitis A uh, vaccine. Um, there were 80 geographic clusters, uh, 40 per arm, that is 40 VI, 40 hepatitis A, uh, roughly uh, 37,000 uh, participants from a total population of 63,000. The target population was blood culture proven typhoid. And the primary goal of the trial was to measure total vaccine uh, protection, recalling total being the summation of direct uh, and herd uh, effects uh, 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 protecting vaccinees. Here is a, uh, a picture of the study site, obviously. Um, uh, in fact, these were the, the slums where Mother Teresa uh, originally uh, worked uh, in Calcutta. Uh, very poor, very impoverished population living under circumstances with terrible uh, water quality, sanitation, and hygiene that greatly facilitates uh, transmission uh, of enteric pathogens like typhoid. Here is a map of the uh, study area uh, showing the 80 different uh, clusters that were randomized, 40 to VI, 40 to uh, hepatitis A. And uh, note that this, these, these are very densely populated slums that abut on each other, as you can see. They're not isolated from each other, which will have, as I'll get, back, get to in a moment, implications for interpreting uh, these uh, results. Well, here are the data. Uh, 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 at, at the time of analysis, um, there were 96 uh, cases in, the, in people who received Hep A vaccine, uh, 34 VI for a protective uh, effect of 65%. Uh, when we compared the incidence rates in non-recipients of VI vaccine in the VI clusters versus non-recipients of hepatitis A vaccine uh, in the hepatitis A clusters, 31 versus 16 cases for 45% indirect protections, uh, a clear uh, a clear piece of evidence for herd protection. And when we looked at overall protection, that is comparing the incidence in everybody in the cluster, regardless of whether they got vaccine or not, uh, comparing the, um, uh, the VI clusters with the hepatitis A clusters, um, 127 versus 50, 
Well, you, you might uh, say, well, you know, sixty percent is a bit of a yawn. Is I mean, that, that, that's not so uh, so impressive, is it? For but what you have to recall is this is a vaccine whose direct protection is about sixty to sixty five percent, and this is everybody, whether or not they they got the vaccine or not, and only about sixty percent of the residents of the VI clusters got vaccine. So that's it, basically the combination of direct and herd effects makes this vaccine behave as if it were a hundred percent direct protective uh, uh, vaccine. Um, all that being said, uh, uh, and you know, cluster randomized trials may sound very attractive. They are in, in many ways. We have to be uh, cognizant that there are several requirements uh, to do cluster randomized trials. As I mentioned, we uh, we would only want to do them in circumstances where the target pathogen is uh, transmitted person to person because herd protection only works uh, on such pathogens. Importantly, and this is a big one, the clusters themselves must correspond to the unit of transmission. That means trans person to person transmission should be occurring within the clusters, but not into the clusters from the outside, either from adjacent clusters or from the outside population not participating in the trial. Obviously, the Calcutta trial violated that, but the effective course of, of, of such inward transmission would be to dilute your estimate of herd protection, which made our results conservative. Basically, that means uh, in real life, you can expect much more uh, uh, herd protection. Uh, for live vaccines transmitted person to person, uh, there should be no transmission, obviously, between clusters. Um, the population uh, should be stable. Obviously, if people are migrating from cluster to cluster, that that uh, that uh, will dilute out any measured effects. Uh, multiple clusters are required. You cannot validly do a cluster randomized trial comparing one cluster of this versus one cluster of that. There's no basis for statistical inference uh, in such a one-to-one -one, uh, trial. Uh, and sample size calculations and analyses must take account of the fact um, that outcomes within clusters um, uh, uh, will be somewhat dependent uh, on one another. Uh, and so basically the sample size requirements for cluster randomized trials are generally substantially higher than for individually randomized trials. Well, are there other mechanisms that we could uh, foresee for doing, um, for measuring uh, herd protection without the biases of, of observational studies uh, and even potentially pre-licensure? Well, actually, we can use individually randomized trials to measure herd protection. And this, of course, may seem quite counterintuitive. Because as I mentioned at the outset, um, the uh, uh, protective efficacy uh, in an individually randomized trial is beloved by regulators uh, because it's, it, it is supposed to measure direct protection of vaccines in isolation from all these herd effects. Because herd effects can vary depending on vaccine coverage, pattern of vaccine, all kinds of things. What, what regulators want to see is is the level of protection that could be generalized from circumstance uh, to to circumstance. So um, how is it that we can actually measure then uh, vaccine herd protection in a trial that is specifically designed to measure only direct vaccine protection? Well, in any uh, individually randomized trial, there will be geographic differences in vaccine coverage due to up differences in uptake uh, uh, and eligibility. Uh, and um, uh, if suitable geographic clusters uh, can be identified, even post hoc, uh, uh, and if there is sufficient variation in, in coverage uh, between these post hoc uh, so-called virtual clusters, uh, vaccine herd effects <clears throat> can be assessed by evaluating the correlation uh, between disease incidence and levels of vaccine coverage within these clusters. 
to uh, give an example of this approach, um, we uh, we uh, went back 20 years after uh, the original trial of killed oral cholera vaccines was done in rural Bangladesh, uh, shown here in 1985, um, which compared the B subunit killed whole cell cholera vaccine versus the whole cell only cholera vaccine versus a E. coli uh, uh, placebo, oral placebo, uh, in Matlab, Bangladesh, in children and adult women with a three-dose regimen of each. Uh, it was an individually randomized trial uh, in which we uh, enrolled about 90,000 people, 62,000 of whom received complete uh, three-dose regimens. Uh, this trial, when analyzed uh, originally, and this is your typical analysis of an individual randomized trial, showed 100, 110 versus 52 versus 41 cases in the three different uh, uh, groups for levels of protective efficacy of 63% and uh, 53% at one year of follow-up. Well, in 2000, when, I guess about 2005, uh, as as we were um, uh, working on a new killed oral cholera vaccine and uh, uh, we're encountering quite a bit of uh, resistance against cholera vaccines we we thought well gee what what if what if the vaccine actually uh, resulted in herd protection uh, that would that would potentially be a game changing uh, observation. So uh, we went back to that old data set and asked the following two questions. Was the risk of cholera among non-vaccinated neighbors of vaccinees inversely related uh, to vaccine coverage? Now, this would indicate indirect protection. And was the risk uh, of vaccinated uh, neighbors of vaccinees also inversely related? This would indicate total uh, protection. And we post hoc uh, created clusters uh, as clusters in neighborhoods in which people live in rural Bangladesh called baris, patrilineally linked uh, groups of homes, uh, of which there are about 6,000 of these uh, in the study area. Um, we mapped out the study area in terms of vaccine coverage uh, of the different baris, and as you can see from the shaded uh, uh, legend in this smooth uh, map, there's substantial variation in vaccine coverage among these 6,000 baris. And then we went back to the data and arranged these 6,000 baris uh, into quintiles, as you can see in the first column, of ascending levels of vaccine coverage of the baris. If you'll focus on the placebo group at the right side of the slide, giving the number uh, of individuals in each qu uh, quintile cases and and incidence rate, you, and, and you look at the incidence rate uh, on the right uh, rightmost column, you can see that uh, if you lived in a low coverage Bari and got a placebo, your risk was about seven cases per thousand. And as you, as you go down uh, into progressively higher levels of coverage, you see a dramatic reduction of incidence so that it's about 1.5 in the highest coverage. That means you, you, you're benefiting, you're getting 80% coverage, 80% uh, protection by placebo just as a function of, of, of herd protection. These are dramatic herd effects. A similar but less dramatic trend was uh, observed for the vaccine group, as you can see in the middle. Um, we weren't sure, quite sure what we to do with these, and, and so I called up my friend Ira Longini, who is a uh, well-known um, um, modeler, uh, and uh, asked, and, and who had an interest in cholera, uh, whether whether he could use these results to parameterize uh, a dynamic population-based uh, um, model of cholera in rural Bangladesh, and this would show on the upper left-hand uh, corner, a typical cholera season. Uh, in, in Bangladesh, cholera occurs, you know, like the sun rises and the sunset. It just, it occurs every year. And it's, 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 it's not a surprise. Uh, and this would be a typical season in the upper left-hand corner with, with, with successively higher levels uh, 
of, of coverage uh, going up to in the lower right-hand side of 58%. What you can see is because of these herd effects, 60% coverage will virtually extinguish transmission of this disease by vaccines that are only themselves only 60% protective. So herd effects can have a dramatic effect on the public health value of vaccine. Indeed, these, th- these were game-changing uh, observations. And when we asked our uh, economist colleagues to uh, uh, use our results to try to evaluate what the implications of this herd protection would be for vaccine cost effectiveness, uh, expressed as cost per DALI uh, uh, gained uh, for groups receiving uh, vaccines at 1 to 14 years of age to uh, populations receiving it for everybody one year and over in the different, three different WHO regions, both with and without herd protection. You can see cost effectiveness uh, for any given program in any different region uh, improves dramatically if you uh, consider uh, herd protection. And if you consider herd protection as shown by uh, those lower solid bars, which are thresholds for vaccine for very cost effective, that basically the vaccine is very cost effective, uh, regardless of the um, target group and setting. So in summary, and I see my chairman sneaking down here uh, and politely warning me, um, uh, introduction of uh, vaccines uh, in the public health practice may reveal protective effects at the population level uh, that are not predicted by individual level uh, protection. And by the way, nobody thought that killed oral cholera vaccines would, would confer herd protection. Uh, vaccine herd protection may be critical to the ability uh, of a vaccine of, to control the disease under realistic public health conditions uh, and may dramatically improve a vaccine's cost effectiveness. Uh, traditionally, herd protection uh, by vaccines have been assessed uh, with observational studies done after licensure and assessing uh, disease trends in relationship to coverage trends. But the potential suitability uh, of both cluster randomized and individually randomized trials uh, for measuring herd protective effects offers the opportunity to assess uh, these very important uh, parameters in vaccine evaluations even before a vaccine is licensed. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I can see several hands up here and then there and here. Hi. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, Do you think of herd immunity differently for bacterial versus viral pathogens? Or do the basic tenets of herd immunity and are not just stand? No, that's the same. Same. Okay. Up, Up there. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Isaac. Uh, you did mention that uh, in cluster randomized trials, um, like the one which you showed in Calcutta, uh, there was a possibility of contamination mm. uh, from one cluster to the other. Uh, so what considerations uh, should one make in terms of selection of clusters as well as randomization to ensure that you minimize this uh, contamination from one cluster to the other? And just a follow-up question. Um, is it, is it also very necessary to define um, a pre-specified contamination level which could be accepted, uh, beyond which one would think that it would validate um, uh, the results? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 in, in answer to your second part, I suppose that could be modeled. I mean, uh, th- there's no kind of well-known r- rule of thumb uh, in that regard, but it certainly could be modeled and will vary depending on the vaccine and the circumstance. Uh, in terms of selecting sites, it's tough. There are very few uh, sites available where you can you can really find isolated uh, uh, clusters that are not only removed from other clusters, but they're also removed from transmission from the outside population. Yeah, you, know, you can you can separate clusters, no problem, but you still have that outside population transmitting the, uh, the infection inward. And so, basically, uh, the, the the best that you can do is is rely on earlier descriptive epidemiologic data that show that most transmission is occurring within some units and then use those units. 
I, I was maybe I missed it, but I saw on one of your slides that uh, measles, the herd immunity, uh, the vaccine coverage has to be in between 55 and 95 percent. I was kind of puzzled there because I thought it had to be in, well at least 90 percent. Yeah, but those are that was in relationship to the range of R naught uh, uh, estimates uh, that had been proposed, uh, and basically the 50 whatever percent. Uh, uh, level of herd uh, immunity just refers to uh, what what you, by the by the herd uh, th uh, immunity threshold formula what what would be required. So so the the problem with indirect protection in the RTC, like you know the in the, for the for the so I mean that could be a problem for trial design. I assume that. You know um, that you may have to take care that there are not too many vaccinated participants within an area um, because it dilutes your efficacy, right? Uh, that you can estimate. That's a very perceptive uh, uh, point. Um, in fact, when Mike Levine first read our our, our paper on this topic, um, what I think piqued your interest, Mike, the most was not the herd protection, but if you look at vaccine protection if, in that in that data table, uh, if you if you look horizontally in in by quintile of coverage, uh, vaccine protection evaporates as you go down uh, in uh, in with levels uh, of coverage. So absolutely right. And actually, we had that problem in the Philippines when we were setting up our pneumococcal conjugate vaccine trial with the endpoint of pneumonia, and, and we wanted to run that for four years. So, so the uh, uh, the DSMB and others were concerned that uh, during that time we were actually introducing herd protection, and and your that would bias your vaccine effectiveness results towards zero. So you need to be sure that you are not getting that impact in there. Here, there, thank you. Thank you. Um, you noted a couple times this is only appropriate for human to human transmission. Is there not a scenario for vector transmitted diseases like malaria if you had a transmission blocking vaccine that this would be appropriate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 person to person transmission is, is used a little bit loosely. Obviously, if there's an intermediate vector, uh, it's con it, it is possible. And certainly, you know, bed nets were, were shown to confer herd protection uh, for malaria uh, in, 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 in trials done years ago. Yeah, ten away from Thailand. Um, I I just uh, impressed about your analysis that sixty percent of vaccine efficacy, uh, and give it about sixty percent of population can reduce the number of um, corella. However, uh, all of this information will come out after it was implemented or in a large trial. But this information was not in the leaflets, in the package insert, or in the individual use. Mm -hmm. How we can communicate this, or how we can take into account this when we're thinking about the programmatic endpoint. Because usually, for example, we said that influenza have 50% effectiveness individually. Mm -hmm. People are reluctant to do it because 50% is too low for me. But actually, if everyone do it, it have herd protection and how yeah. we can use this information in communication or programmatic planning. That's, that's a good point. And you know, one of the problems in communicating uh, is that um, herd protection is kind of a, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not a fixed value for a given vaccine. It, uh, it really depends on, on vaccine, who you target in a population, what percentage uh, uh, coverage you achieve, uh, what pattern of coverage geographically you have, what is the epidemiology of the infection, is it heterogeneous? And, I mean, so many things that, that vary from place to place, which is why, you know, regulators hate or, yeah, it, uh, it, it just kind of muddies, it muddies the water. So it's difficult to communicate. Um, and it's, uh, and, 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 and regarding, you know, package inserts, it's it's you know uh, very rarely I'm only aware of one uh, cluster randomized trial done pre uh, licensure and that was for pneumococcal conjugate vaccines and the American um, uh, Indian Reservation in in Arizona uh, and New Mexico um, uh, so it's it's not commonly uh, 
uh, uh, accepted as part of the clinical development sequence. And actually, that study did have difficulties because the access to care differed between those clusters, and also that there was an RSV epidemic in some of the clusters, but not in others, which then impacted the incidence of uh, pneumococcus. So it, it, it's it's a trial. Ask Kate O'Brien, but I mean, it gave her a lot of headache during the time. Any further questions? Yes. Hi, Stephanie Vicker Burnett. Um, I noticed that when you used Hep A as a control vaccine, you also had a placebo. Is it still feasible to use just a a vaccine, another vaccine as a control? And if so, how do you then control for any kind of um, reactogenicity or safety concerns around that difference testing, trialing a vaccine? Yeah, well, 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 Hep A was used as a control vaccine in the VI trial. Um, obviously, you know, blinding um is uh is is difficult um and in fact in that that trial was not formally double blind it was an open label uh trial um and so you know other other means uh had to be employed to reassure ourselves that the absence of double blinding did not distort um the uh, the data such as what we call uh, analyzing a, a bias indicator outcome uh, in that case it was paratyphoid uh, fever um and showing that there was no effect yeah so uh but uh uh yeah it's it, it can be a challenge